Hello and welcome to Lost Love Chronicles. If you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles. If you know yourself but not the enemy, for every victory gained you will also suffer a defeat. If you know neither the enemy nor yourself, you will succumb in every battle. Sun Tzu The Art of War Hmm, where do I start my tale? The beginning, you say? Good idea. I'm Mark Gallows, my wife is Kelly Gallows, and this is our tale. I remember being born. Okay, just kidding there. But that would be the beginning, right? Okay. I'll skip ahead some to when I first met Kelly Everett. We were six years old, and to me, girls were still icky and gross. So I was a bit pissed off that I was being made to spend time and play with a girl. It didn't matter to me that she was black. She was a girl, and that made her icky. Luckily, I got over that tidbit as I got older. Now, our dads had served together in the army back in Vietnam and had become best friends on the battlefield. After the war, they moved back home and got married. Dad to my mom and her daddy to her mama. It turned out that Kelly and I were born at around the same time and Kelly's daddy moved them to Santa Barbara where my dad had his construction business. Dad gave Mr. Everett a job and soon they were partners in the business. Everything was going well, but when Kelly and I entered second grade, their construction business fell on hard times. So they fell back on what they knew and re-enlisted in the U.S. Army. Over the years, we were stationed at several duty posts together. Kelly and I had grown to be the second-generation best friends. Our parents had joked about us becoming when we were younger. So when we'd get posted together, we'd gravitate to each other. Hey, anyone who grows up an army brat knows that moving every few years is tough and you have to prove yourself at each new school to avoid getting bullied or shunned. So we stuck together and had each other's back wherever we found ourselves. Our friendship grew even after we started dating. No, we didn't date each other at that time. We dated other people. To her, I was just her best friend, and she was the same to me. However, after my first breakup, we started a tradition that we would go the mall on the Saturday following either of us breaking up to a matinee movie usually something violent and full of action, as we would have a lot of tension to work out. Watching a sci-fi or action movie usually did the trick. We'd get pumped up and let our frustrations and hurt flow out of us with the action unfolding on screen. When our dads got out as we entered our sophomore year of high school, they started up their construction business again, and this time it worked out really well. More and more jobs took them down to LA and even as far as up to Sacramento. They were gone sometimes for a week or two at a time, but they were in high demand. General contractors, and more importantly, competent general contractors are always in high demand, as long as they don't keep their business too localized. So it came to pass that Kelly and I became even closer to each other than to our own families. We also had a few close calls and nearly crossed the line, several times between best friends and lovers. We kept our cool, though. Barely. It got harder and harder no pun intended, to stop myself from crossing the line with her. We didn't want to ruin our friendship. It all came to a head when we got dumped the week before our senior prom by our significant others. Ty just up and dumped her over the phone, which caught everyone by surprise. Meanwhile, Bridget was in the process of writing me a Dear Mark letter, which she then delivered to my house without a word. She wouldn't even talk to me. So, needless to say, we were both SOL for prom. That Saturday, we lucked out and caught a Chuck Norris marathon at the Cineplex. Older Chuck movies are still great. Now, Kelly was still a virgin, as was I. She was a cheerleader and track star at our school, while I played baseball. My buddy Tyrone had asked about dating Kelly, and I had introduced them. He played first base, while I played second base. We racked up quite a few double plays, and we were a great one-two punch offensively at the plate, too. Well, Tyrone had dated Kelly for almost a year. Hell, I thought, and a lot of others thought, that they would get married after graduation, Ty's history notwithstanding. Well, to make a long story short, Ty dumped Kelly a week before prom so he could take another girl. The girl he took was supposed to be my date, my aforementioned ex-girlfriend Bridget. So that ended not just my relationship, but Kelly's relationship with Ty and my friendship with Ty. Oh, and Kelly's friendship with Bridget, too. They had been on the cheerleading squad together. Pretty convoluted, right? Yeah, a lot of hurt had been hurled out at the exact same time with as little effort as possible. 
Ty and Bridget had hurt both my best friend and me at the exact same time. Like I said, we lucked out with the Chuck Norris movie marathon that Saturday. Oh, Ty didn't get away with it and scathed, though. But we'll get to that shortly. Kelly and I ended up going to prom together. I still had my two tickets, and neither one of us had a date, so it just made sense. We danced. We had fun. And that seemed to be a slap in the face to old Tyrone and Bridget. I still remember picking her up at her house, which was two houses down from mine, on the night of prom. She walked downstairs in that emerald green dress that hugged her figure like a second skin from the waist up. My breath caught in my throat as I wondered for the first time what the hell Tyrone had been thinking. Mr. Everett saw my expression, chuckled deep in his throat, and told me to have his princess home by midnight. I vaguely remember agreeing to do so, and took Kelly's hand. She looked stunning with her hair done in ringlets that fell around her lovely face. She wore minimal makeup, which she honestly didn't need at all. I was awestruck by how beautiful she looked that night, and barely managed to squeak out how beautiful she looked. Kelly smiled, hugged me, and told me that I looked very handsome too. That broke me out of my hormone-driven stupor, and we were once again best friends and I was completely comfortable with her again. I even managed to pay attention to the road while driving us to prom. Well, Ty and Bridget, a fiery hot redhead, were rubbing our noses in it as often as possible that Ty had stolen my girl and dumped Kelly while he was at it. At first we ignored them. They weren't worth the trouble, but trouble would be coming Ty's way soon. In spite of that vow to keep our cool, Kelly damn near lost it a couple times, and I admittedly wasn't far behind her when Ty really kicked the taunting up a notch. He was grinding on Bridget every chance he got. He would then look over at us and grin while Bridget would smirk. However, we steeled ourselves and kept our tempers in check barely. We had to keep our cool, and we did so. My whole plan depended on it. Things went from bad to worse as everyone knew that Tyrone had stolen Bridget from me, while they looked at Kelly as my consolation prize. What they didn't know was that Bridget wasn't all she was cracked up to be. She was a decent kisser, but Kelly was better. No, the big secret was that Ty had stolen a lot of white girlfriends with his smooth talk and the myth of the size. Now, Ty's dog status had been our secret, too. We'd laugh about his conquests, which I didn't take seriously. I thought he was bullshitting. I started to worry after he bragged about how he stole Max Garrett's girl three months before he started dating Kelly. Max was an okay guy, even though we weren't much more than passing acquaintances. We jocks were cool to each other, mostly. The other jocks found my quirk with comic books to be uncool. That was okay, though. I had some nerd friends to talk comics with, and Kelly is a fan of some of the indie comics. No, I had worried because Max and Cheryl had a very public breakup and she'd refused to tell anyone why she dumped Max. She had then moved away a month later. I can't believe that a-hole. Kelly whispered to me as we danced close during a slow song, breaking me out of my reverie of all the things that had happened to bring us to this point. It was coming up on the coronation of the king and queen. Don't worry about it, Kel. I talked to Max earlier this week. I also talked to Sam and Dave, and they're getting the word out, too. I smirked as I whispered in her ear. Besides, I have the hottest girl here in my arms right now. She smiled at me, showing off all her perfect teeth. Damn, you are one smooth talker. She giggled and kissed me with her lush full lips. I returned her kiss, then she broke it to look at me seriously. What are you planning? You'll see. Trust me, before you and Ty started dating, he was a big time dog when it comes to women. Turns out, he still is. When he asked me to introduce you, he swore he was done with the crap he'd been doing. I, unfortunately, believed him, and I'm sorry for him hurting you. I nodded to where they were dancing and shooting glares at us occasionally. Okay, white boy, spill it, and don't worry about the shit he pulled. I knew he was a dog before we started dating, and I thought he'd changed too. She smirked back. Well, remember just before you two started dating and Max got dumped by Cheryl? I asked with a raised eyebrow. Yeah, that was you, G. No way. He didn't. That piece of shit. Kelly was stunned as she got it. Yeah, she'd known he was a dog, but not that big of a dog. Until right that moment. Yep, exactly. I nodded. Cheryl had moved away shortly after that incident, and Max had never been told why she dumped him. Until earlier in the week. 
I made sure he needed to keep his cool until tonight though. Somehow, someway, we all managed to keep word from getting out that something major was going down on prom night involving Tyrone. Kelly got a huge grin on her face as she got my meaning. You told Max, didn't you? I just nodded and smiled smugly. I caught Ty and Bridget glaring at us again and let them think what they wanted about my smugness. It was time for a bit of vengeance with a dash of style. The song ended and we walked back to the punch bowl hand in hand, our fingers interlaced. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the moment you've all been waiting for. Our principal, Mr. Skinner, no, not the one from The Simpsons, even though he was just about as goofy, announced that the votes were all in for prom king and queen. After announcing the second and first runners-up, neither of which were Ty and Bridget, Ty and Bridget were even more convinced than before that they'd won it. Then Mr. Skinner smiled out over the crowd as we reached the moment I'd been waiting for. And the winners are Mark Gallows and Kelly Everett. What the hell? Tyrone shouted in disbelief. He'd just been upstaged by his ex-friend and his ex-girlfriend. My vengeance was complete. Yeah, Tyrone. What the hell? Max said as he came up behind my former bud with Sam and Dave beside him. What the hell were you doing going after Cheryl? What the hell were you doing with Cheryl that caused her to break up with me? You know, I didn't believe it at first, but when I called Cheryl up, we're still friends, by the way. She confirmed what Mark told me about what you were saying. Ty shot me a glare full of hatred before grinning at Max. Hey, man, that was just us guys bullshitting. I never did nothing with Cheryl, man. Max wasn't buying it, and neither were the other guys who'd had their girls stolen by Tyrone. Yes, I told all three of them. Like I said, when Ty stole mine, we were no longer brothers, so the bro code was no longer in effect. He really should have thought of that before he set his sights on Bridget. But then, he always thought with his little head first. Kelly and I went up on stage where our crowns were waiting. We were crown king and queen, and after thanking everyone who voted for us, took the dance floor for our coronation dance. I glanced around, but Ty and the guys whose girlfriends he'd messed with weren't in the gym anymore. Neither was Bridget, from the lack of fiery red hair anywhere to be seen. I leaned forward and kissed my best friend as her lips parted for mine. God, you're beautiful. I whispered as we broke the kiss. You're pretty fine yourself, baby. She whispered back as she molded her body to mine. All 5 feet 5 inches and 128 pounds of athletic goddess with C-cup jugs pressed up against my 6 feet, 1 inch 198 pound frame. Her heels added another 4 inches making her 5 feet 9 inches and just the right height for me to not get a crick in my neck while kissing her. To be honest, I had kissed Kelly before this. When we were with our parents stationed in Germany before our dad's ETS, and we were still in junior high, we'd done some experimenting together. Nothing really sexual, though the thought had crossed my mind. Hell, I was a hormone-driven teenager, and Kelly had grown in a nubile Nubian beauty. But no, we just kissed and found what we liked and told each other what we liked. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, my best friend was my first kiss. My thoughts were snapped back to the present as Max and the guys returned to the gym, but Ty was nowhere to be seen. Neither was Bridget, still. Yeah, she kind of disappeared at the same time Ty had. Oh well, Bridget wanted Ty. She could be with Ty. No worries here. I was with Kelly and was more than happy to have my best friend in my arms. I somehow knew in my heart and soul that she would never cheat me. Max and the guys had satisfied smiles on their faces as they rejoined their dates, and I figured they had beaten Ty down like the dog he is. I wasn't far off the mark, as it turned out, but more on that later. Kelly and I finished our dance as prom king and queen. God almighty, she's a beauty to behold. For reference, think Nicole B. Harry only taller. Yes, she's that cute and sexy. And that night, she looked even better than normal, and that's saying something. All I could think was that Tyrone had to be an idiot to dump her like he had. We walked back to the punch bowl for another drink, with smiles from all of our friends sent our way. Now that they knew the truth about Tyrone, they no longer felt sympathy for us. Now they gave us looks of respect, that in spite of Tyrone rubbing it in our faces, we kept our heads up high and kept Ty and Bridget from ruining our night. And we'd done it with style. Some might call me a coward for having others do my dirty work for me. But that wasn't the case. I just told some guys what Ty had done. My revenge on him was in living well and taking the king's spot from him 
while Kelly took the queen's spot from Bridget. I just facilitated Max's and the other guy's revenge on Ty for what he'd done to them in the past, since I found out the truth about Ty's bragging. All debts were paid that night, as far as justice went, but the night wasn't over yet. Now, my plan had been to take Kelly home after prom. We would hit one after party for a bit, then head on home. I wasn't going to presume anything. What I didn't realize, however, was that Kelly had her own agenda for tonight. When prom was wrapping up, Kelly grabbed me and whispered in my ear. The night isn't over yet, baby. I think it's time we do something we should have done a long time ago. The way she said it didn't take a rocket scientist to figure out what she was referring to, and I'm smarter than the average bear, if I do say so myself. Eat your heart out, Yogi. I felt myself hardening at the thought of being with Kelly sexually. The thought of giving her my virginity as she gave me hers did the trick, and a switch was thrown in my head. I allowed myself to love my best friend as more than a best friend. It was at that moment that I fell inextricably in love with her. Good, because I'm thinking the same thing, beautiful. I replied with a look that showed her just what I wanted. I think she could tell by the growing bulge in my pants, too. Mom got me birth control pills when I told her that I was going to give it up to Ty. Too bad he didn't want this. She gave me a wink as she said it along with a sexy smile. Well, Ty is a dog and an idiot. I countered. I'm neither one of those. But if we do this, it isn't going to be just a one-night thing. Kelly, I love you, and I'm falling in love with you. Are you okay with that? I love you too, Mark. I always have, and you know that. I've been falling in love with you over the last week, so it's all good. The smile she gave me and the look of love in her eyes told me that she was telling the truth. I took her in my arms and kissed her again. This kiss was different than the kisses we'd shared earlier though. This was a kiss that claimed her as my own. This was a kiss full of the heart's promise that we would always be together from this night forward. She gave back as good as she got, giving me the same unspoken promise. However, as soon as we broke the kiss, she put that promise into words as well. I'm yours, Mark. Forever and always, she whispered in my ear. Remember what I told you when we were ten? I thought back to when we were in Georgia together, and going to Morgan Road Middle School in Augusta for 7th grade. I grinned as I remembered that conversation. Yeah, I remember. Should we get married before I go to basic training, or after I get home? After, baby. We need to get the wedding planned, and tell our folks what we're going to do. And I need to get you a ring, sweetheart, I replied, grinning ear to ear to match her own. We left the prom shortly after that, and got into my Camaro. She told me to drive to our spot. It was the spot we'd gone to whenever we needed to talk and needed the privacy to do so. The bluffs are the cliffs overlooking the Pacific near Santa Barbara. They're a very romantic spot, by the way. When we got there, Kelly pulled the blanket out of the back seat that I always kept in there. We got out, and she spread the blanket on the grass in a secluded spot. I took her in my arms and unzipped her dress as she untied my tie and unbuttoned my tux jacket. We undressed each other slowly her dress and my tux landing on the grass. When she removed her strapless bra, I looked upon her beautiful jugs for the first time. God, those were perfect. I laid her down gently on the blanket, itself laying on the soft, thick grass. I moved down beside her, drinking in the sight of her beautiful body before leaning down and kissing her lips. She asked in a whisper as we broke the kiss. I've never done it before, Kel, I replied, not knowing exactly what to do. Just give it a shot like the guys in the adult movies, do it? She smiled at me, reminding me of the movie I'd been watching in preparation of this moment. I blushed as I kissed her again softly and tenderly. Okay, but first I'm going to explore you with my lips and tongue, sweetheart. She shuddered as I whispered it, and her breathing grew heavier. Do it, baby. Please. She was my best friend, and now something much more than she had been before. I knew that I would want her for the rest of my life. Oh my God! She exclaimed. Did you like that, baby? I asked with a wide smile. She looked into my eyes with an intense love and smiled radiantly for me as she pulled me up as she sat up herself and kissed me with more passion than I had thought possible. I loved it, boo! She whispered as she finally broke the kiss. I moved over her and looked into her eyes. I love you, Kel. I always have. I love you too, Mark. You know that, she replied with a smile as she stroked my cheek. 
I know. I'm ready for it. Make me a woman, boo. And with that, we had an amazing sex. She sat up and kissed me. She gasped and looked at her watch. Baby, we need to get home, she exclaimed in an urgent whisper. It's almost midnight. Well, princess, we wouldn't want you to turn into a pumpkin, would we? I grinned. She giggled. No, we wouldn't. Besides, I think your Camaro would be turning into a pumpkin, if this was the fairy tale. I feigned shock. Well, it's a damn good thing this is real life. I did too much work on that car for it to turn into a pumpkin on prom night. I stuck my tongue out and crossed my eyes, giving her my silly look. She giggled again and kissed me again. Take me home, baby. Yes, ma'am, I replied, practicing how to address female officers once I entered the army. I like him, ma'am. I think you should call me that from now on. She gave me her own silly look, and I grinned and kissed her. We dressed and I gathered up the blanket and towels and put them in my trunk. I keep my car clean, but I would have to wash out the trunk and wash the towels and blanket in the morning. I dropped her off at her house and walked her to her door. The light was still on, and I could see her father waiting inside for her to get home. I caught a glimpse of her mom, too, and was suddenly very nervous. Don't worry, baby. Mama and Daddy love you. You know that. I think we need to talk to them tomorrow, though. She was reading my mind. I knew that we would have to break the news to our families about what we wanted to do. Kelly had also elected to join the army. She went in P, while I went infantry. Yeah, she wanted to be a cop, and I was just looking for the adventure. We would be going to MEPS down in LA in September, so we had the whole summer to spend together. What happened to Tyrone and Bridget, you ask? Well, Ty was found the morning after prom. He had been stripped and left on the beach after he had dog spray painted across his chest and back in neon orange paint. Seems that Max and the guys weren't too thrilled with him and decided to reveal his status to the world. Bridget wasn't anywhere near there, as the guys had taken her home. Turns out, she was too embarrassed by what had happened to say anything to anyone, and when Ty asked her to talk to the cops about it, she told him that she didn't know what he was talking about. Gotta love shallow girls. From what Max told me later, they dropped her off first before taking Ty and decorating him with the fitting label. Kelly and I laughed our asses off as Max, Sam, and Dave told the tale of how Tyrone had kept trying to bullshit them even as they made him strip, then held him in place as Max did his best Pablo Picasso impression with the orange can. I never said it was a good impression of Picasso. Just his best impression. Fast forward three months, and plans rarely work out the way we want. Kelly and I couldn't get stationed together as boyfriend and girlfriend, and it turned out that we had to wait until after we got out to get married. In order to not have to deal with a long-distance relationship, we had a serious discussion in the airport after my folks dropped us both off. We agreed to go back to being best friends for the duration of our tours. No pressure, and we could see whoever we wanted while we weren't together. We came to an understanding that if we fell in love with other people, we would stay best friends, but wouldn't be together while in a relationship with someone else. Yes, it was difficult for both of us. We had spent the entire summer together and figured out what the other liked. Kelly had kept practicing her B-job technique on me, and by the time we left for basic, she was damn good at it. We agreed to not tell each other about any liaisons we had while we were in. We also agreed to be as safe as possible with whoever we slept with. That meant no sex without condoms. It was the closest we would ever come to an open relationship, but we weren't technically together anymore, at that point. No. I won't tell you about who I was with while I was in. Kelly never told me, but we both admitted there had been others. Hell, we barely saw each other in those four years. We took leave together when we could, but that wasn't very often, and there were a few other times we saw each other, but I'll get to that in a moment. We had emailed each other constantly though. We would call or email and kept in touch. Our conversations were mostly about how our jobs were going and if we were having fun or not. Well, at least they were for the first two years. We always ended each conversation with, love ya, before hanging up or hitting send. Two years in, 9-11 happened, and we got deployed. We ended up stationed fairly close to each other in Afghanistan, but a world apart. She was placed in a non-combat area in Kandahar while I was in the thick of hunting down the Taliban with the second ranger bat. We were full of patriotism and wanted nothing more than to find the mastermind who had killed thousands of people and bring him to justice. Granted, 
my idea of justice for him was a round between his eyes, a perfect T-zone kill. Unfortunately, I never got a shot at him. Needless to say, we still talked and emailed, but not nearly as frequently as we had before. We met up a couple times while in Afghanistan and spent a few days getting reacquainted with each other's body. At that time, those were the best three days of my life. We decided not to re-up when it came time to decide whether or not to re-enlist. We wanted to get out of there and be together. It was a rough road we took and our lives with each other had been put on hold, but we would be together finally. Through the grace of God, we made it out alive from that war zone. We actually out-processed together at Foot Jackson and flew home to LAX together. We joined the Mile High Club that day, and man, it was worth it to screw Kelly again, even if that damned airplane lavatory was barely big enough. When we landed, both of our families were there to greet us. We walked off the plane hand in hand, having gotten back together over the past couple days at Jackson and on the plane ride home. We were both dressed in civvies, having changed out of our class A's after out-processing was complete. Both sets of parents could tell right away that we were back together. We finally unlaced our fingers from each other as our families hugged us. My shithead brother even gave me a hug, realizing that I'd done what he would never have the intestinal fortitude to do. Hey, as much as I detest the little toad sometimes, he's still family. Kelly's sister also joined in on the hugs. She'd grown up quite a bit from when we'd left. She wasn't a gawky beanpole anymore. She'd filled out into a good-looking woman. Yes, I had some fantasies about getting Kelly and Cassie into bed at the same time. I know, I know. I'm a dog. Not enough of a dog to cheat on Kelly, at least. I'm not Tyrone, nor will I ever be like Tyrone. Hell, what guy out there hasn't fantasized about having two sisters at the same time? Fantasies like the one I entertained about Kelly and Cassie are just that, though. Fantasies. Imagination at work. In other words, it was not going to happen in real life. Anyway, we decided that we would get jobs and use our GI bills to get some college under our belts. Getting a degree in a good field would ensure our futures. We found an apartment and some part-time jobs and settled into a fairly hectic routine. We still made time for each other, though. We always made time for each other. Now, I'd always like computers. Not only that, but I was good with computers. So, of course, I chose computer science for my major. I also got my CompTIA certifications in A+, Network+, Security+, Server+, and I was more than ready to join the workforce. Let it be known that those are some of the most brain-draining tests ever created. I also took the a exams in one day, even though it isn't recommended. I barely passed the practical, but that was okay. I passed. So after I got my first job in the IT field, I bought the ring. A half-carat diamond in a 24-carat gold setting. I had it sized for her petite finger and boxed up. Yes, it took most of my credit card to buy it but I figured that I would have it paid off in about six or seven months. With my new job working as a network technician, I was making some good money. It was worth it, though. That night when Kelly got back to our apartment, I had the wine, the dinner from Mario's, and the ring in the box in my pocket. I don't cook. Just to make that clear. I tried once. It didn't end well. Kelly was working and had received her MBA early, having aced all the courses necessary in record time. We had run a real risk of burning ourselves out, but we managed to keep each other from going completely loony tunes. Hey, beautiful. Long day at work? I asked as I took her in my arms and kissed her. She dropped her purse and bag on the counter and kissed me back lovingly. Hmm. You might say that, baby. Just found out that Justine is retiring. We're getting some new guy from out of state, she said, rolling her eyes. Now, we both love Justine. She'd been kind of a second mom to both of us. It saddened me too, but then I just shrugged. Well, we can invite her to the wedding, I said with a smile. Kel, I know I never did this properly when I asked you to marry me, so I'm doing it now. I got down on one knee and pulled the felt covered box out of my pocket. Kelly Lynn Everett, will you marry me? I asked as I opened the box. Oh baby Kelly's eyes went wide and her smile shone radiantly as she took in the ring I'd bought her. Yes, she threw her arms around me as she sank to the floor on her knees too. We kissed for what must have been an hour before she finally broke it and I was able to slide the ring onto her finger. I love you, Mark, she said as she kissed me again once we were standing. 
She admired the ring and kissed me again. I love you too, Kel, I replied, kissing my love one more time. We ate in silence, just looking into each other's eyes as we smiled at each other. One of us would grin occasionally, and we'd laugh or giggle. We were both giddy with anticipation. We'd been unofficially engaged for almost four years, living together nearly as long, and had been working our bums off in part-time jobs, as well as going to school pretty much year-round. Now I had a full-time job, and was making decent cash. Now we were officially engaged. Life was good. Kelly was now working full-time at the real estate office, and was the executive assistant to the boss, Mrs. Justine Hart. Mr. David Hart was an ad executive, and between the two of them, they were clearing a million a year after taxes. Now Justine was going to retire. Some new guy was coming in to take over the office. Oh well, I'd meet him eventually. Justine and David were good friends, and Kelly was going to miss having Justine as a boss. I couldn't blame her. So when is Justine going to officially retire? I asked as we sat on the couch after dinner. We were snuggled up, just enjoying each other's company as we'd been doing now ever since we got out. It had become another tradition, enjoying some quiet time after dinner. Just the two of us, no other cares in the world, and catching up on each other's day, she said in a year. So she's going to be around for a while yet, she said. I'm gonna miss her, boo. I don't know this guy coming in. What if he's a hard bum? I shrugged and chuckled. Don't worry, baby girl. I'm pretty sure he will be just as impressed with you as Justine is. To go from being an MP to being an executive assistant is a hell of a transition. You did it easily. Haha, <laughs> easily? Yeah, right? She snorted. Honey, you have no idea how hard it was to become something totally different than what I was doing for four years. I raised an eyebrow at that and looked into her dark amber-brown eyes. Oh, hmm, let's see. Infantry, sniper, ranger, and two tours in Afghanistan to computer geek. Yep, I guess you're right. I gave her my silly face, eyes crossed and tongue stuck out the side of my mouth, and she actually blushed as she realized what she just said. Sorry, boo. You're right, she acknowledged. I laughed. Don't worry about it, sweetheart. So, when do you want to get married? ASAP, honey. I want to be Mrs. Kelly Gallows by the end of the month, she grinned as she said it. I knew we'd get married, baby. Even back when we were kids. I think I did too. Damn glad we finally got around to it, I replied with a grin of my own. It dawned on me in that instant that we really are soulmates. Well, that conversation led to us getting together with our families to get the wedding planned ASAP. Our moms took over the planning with Kelly and left us guys out of the loop completely. So we sat around and drank beer while the women folk planned the wedding. It's great to be a guy, sometimes. Well, we almost got married before the end of the month. We were actually married on July 4th, as that would be an anniversary I would never be able to forget. It was true, even though I'd never be able to forget that day as long as I lived anyhow. Kelly was gorgeous in her white wedding dress. I wore my dress blues and even got my high and tight haircut back for the occasion. I wanted to look sharp for my lovely bride. I succeeded. Justine and David came to the wedding and congratulated us. They then did something completely unexpected when they went ahead and paid for the wedding as their wedding gift to us. It was your traditional Catholic service, of course. That meant long and boring, and if I hadn't been standing there with Kelly by my side and my friend Kevin beside me in his dress blues too, ready to kick my bum if I fell out, I might have just fallen asleep. Well, when the priest finally said, you may kiss the bride, I was more than ready to, and lifted Kelly's veil and kissed her lovingly and deeply. For a good two minutes at least, we were broken from the kiss by the priest himself, who cleared his throat meaningfully. We both blushed as we turned to smile at our friends and family. Before you start thinking we'd taken any of the New Age vows that include a bunch of bullshit or silly weird vows, no? We wrote our own to each other. We definitely included forsaking all others in there, though. That was the most important one to both of us. We'd walked into the church fully committed to each other already. We walked out with that commitment not just cemented in our minds, but in the bands of gold around our left ring fingers. What God hath joined, let no one tear asunder, the priest had said. Damn right, Father. Kelly and I made love every chance we got. She started putting in longer hours at the office while 
I started putting in longer hours at Jones and Sutton Networks as well. We were working 10 or 12 hour days sometimes, but we had one golden rule for making time with each other. No weekends? It had cost us both a bit of potential extra cash to keep that promise to each other. Oh well, we had enough to put down on a house at least. We were able to move out of the apartment and into our own three-bedroom ranch-style house shortly after New Year's, and we had a lot of fun shopping for furniture and decorating the place. Okay, Kelly had a lot of fun, and I just did everything she asked of me. Granted, she always repaid me for my efforts. Move the furniture around so it was in just the right spot? No problem. Be job as a reward? Awesome. Now, we had arguments every once in a while. What married couple doesn't? Mostly they were small and meaningless in the grand scheme of things. When we'd have one, we would talk it out after we'd calm down some. I found the best way to head off an argument at the pass was to say, yes, baby, whenever she made a point. I would also take her in my arms and kiss her whenever she was getting irate over some point that I couldn't see. It helped sometimes. Other times, she was really angry. But, as always, we would calm down and work it out like normal. We were doing great. Married for just under a year and madly in love, as we'd been basically since prom. Even when we'd been seeing others because long-distance relationships suck, and we didn't want to put ourselves through that kind of pressure, we were still best friends. Now that we were married, we were also still best friends. We continued to talk about anything and everything. I guess that a lot of married couples don't do that. But then, when you've known your spouse all your life, and confide all your hopes, dreams, and fears to them, it builds a bond that grows and grows. Like I said, we're closer to each other than to our own families. The biggest obstacle so far was when Justine retired and the new guy took over the office. The real estate business had been recovering slowly and some cuts had to be made. Luckily, with her skills in office management, Kelly was kept on. A few of the sales reps were let go, however. Kelly was kept on as Richard's executive assistant, just as Justine had promised. Justine had written a glowing recommendation for Kelly, and Richard took it to heart. He also liked Kelly's looks a bit too much, but more about that in a bit. The trouble started about four months after Richard Jefferson took over the office, and Justine and Dave were in Tahiti for a second honeymoon vacation. Hell, it was the Monday before Thanksgiving, of all times. Well, we didn't realize it at the time, but that's when it started. We were still working long hours at our respective jobs. We'd call each other when we got off work, and she'd either start some dinner when she got home, or I would pick up some fast food when I got off work. Like I said, I don't cook. We did PT three times a week early in the morning, which became part of our routine too. Push-ups, sit-ups, and a two- or three-mile run, usually. We'd do it together, and during one two-mile run, Kelly told me that Richard had made an inappropriate comment to her at work the day before. What did he say? I asked. He said I had a fine booty, she replied. I laughed. Well, you do. Your booty is one of the many things I love about you. Well, you're my husband. You're allowed to love my booty, she giggled, then turned serious. I'm not a big fan of how Richard has been looking at me lately, though. That brought me back down to earth as I glanced over at her. She had a worried look on her face, and I decided right then and there to find out more about Richard Jefferson. From Kelly's description of him, he sounded like a bodybuilder or football player who'd kind of let himself go after hitting 40. He was big, but had a gut on him and some love handles. She put him at about 6 feet 3 inches, 2 inches taller than me, and about 275 pounds, she guessed. She had said when he first arrived that it was cool to have a brother in there in a management position. She thought it would be cool to work with him, and mostly she said it was. However, he had lately been acting as if he wanted to screw her. Don't worry, boo. I'm going to do some checking up on Richard Jefferson. I promised her as we got back to the house. Thanks, baby. I dunno, something just doesn't seem right about him, she said with a worried look on her face. Tell you what, I'll drop by and take you to lunch today. Okay, that will give me a chance to meet the guy. I smiled. Her eyes lit up. Great idea, baby. She squealed and threw herself into my arms. Put the fear of God into him. Might not be necessary, I smiled back. As long as he respects our marriage and our love for each other, I don't see any harm in some light flirting. But if he decides he still wants a shot at you, I'll do what I have to do.
Good. I know you will, boo. She kissed me again. God. I love that woman and her kisses. The morning passed quickly, and I told James, my boss, that I was going to take my wife to lunch. He didn't have a problem with that, and told me to take the rest of the day off. We'd finally finished the Jensen account, and I was going to have a lot more free time until the next big job came down the pipe. Six months of running miles of Cat6 cable and hooking up over 800 computers to Jensen International's intranet, then getting their internal server up and running had been a hell of a job. Each computer had been upgraded to Windows 7 from XP, which had taken tons of external hard drives and the server itself had to be upgraded to server 2010 from 2002. Now, though, we were going to reap the rewards. More free time and possibly a vacation. The 10 and 12 hour days were getting to me. I couldn't wait to tell Kelly what we'd accomplished. She always loves hearing about my job, even if she isn't as computer savvy as I am. I drove my Camaro over to the real estate office and parked right by the front door. Now it was time to go in and see this big boss dude for myself. As I stepped inside, I saw that Janie was at the front desk. Hey, Janie. Hi, Mark. You here to pick up? She was cut off by a booming voice. Hey, you must be Sandy's husband, Richard Jefferson said as he extended his hand. Sandy married a Mark too, but why would he automatically assume that I was Sandy's Mark and not Kelly? I shook his hand making sure that my first two fingers were extended, as I felt him trying to squeeze the life out of my hand. If you extend your first two fingers along your opponent's wrist, it makes it impossible for him to Roman handshake you. That fact wasn't lost on Richard as I smiled affably at him. Actually, I'm Kelly's husband, Mark. You must be Richard Jefferson. Good to meet you. I'm here to pick Kelly up for lunch. The emotions that went across his face in the space of a few seconds told me everything I needed to know at that time about Dickhead Jefferson. First was shock, probably at the fact that I was white. Second was confusion, which I attributed to him asking himself, why would that fine sister marry this boy other than their own community? Third was a flash of anger that spoke volumes about his character. The another emotion I saw was a twinge of fear, as I obviously wasn't going to let him squeeze my hand into submission. The Sinuvowich was jealous. I'll give him a little credit for recovering quickly. Well, it's great to meet you, Mark, he said as he released my hand as if it had been burned. Kelly should be out in a moment. He then turned on his heel and entered his office, closing the door behind him. I saw him through the window as he pulled out his cell phone and dialed a number. He was using an Android, and that gave me an idea. I smiled at Janie as I sat down and brought up the apps on my Blackberry. I activated one and found the signal I was looking for. I then cloned that signal. You don't work in IT without picking up some useful tips and apps, not to mention a few dirty tricks here and there. That's all there is to it. Kelly came out of her office and smiled when she saw me. I took her in my arms and in front of a grinning Janie, kissed my wife lovingly. Janie is a friend, by the way. She and her husband Tim had hosted the last company Christmas party before Justine retired. This year was going to be our turn. I have the rest of the day off, baby. I winked at my wife. Think you can take it off too? Well, Thanksgiving is in a couple days, so probably, my wife replied. Sounds good, beautiful. I grinned as she gave me a peck on the lips and went to knock on Dick's door. Yeah, that guy could be trouble. While she was talking to Dickhead, I sent a bit of spyware to his phone that would keep me apprised of any text sent or received and any calls he got or made. Also, I added an option to intercept his outgoing and incoming texts. Yes, folks. It's possible. Scary. Right? I also made a new folder called Dickhead for his incoming texts and the numbers he called and who called him. I felt the hair on the back of my neck stand up whenever I thought about him. Yeah, our brief meeting had set off the klaxon in my brain. I was at DEFCON 3. I knew there was a problem coming, and his name was Dick Jefferson. Know your enemy. Sun Tzu knew what he was talking about. Knowledge is power, which meant that I needed to know everything about the man. His likes and dislikes, his marital status, his financials, his history. Everything. Kelly came back grinning ear to ear as she said that Richard had given her the rest of the day off, too. We laced our fingers as we held hands and left together. We went to Carl's Jr. for lunch, and as we sat there, she asked what I thought of Richard. Oh, you mean Dick? I asked with no trace of a smile. Yeah, I don't like him or trust him. 
His face cheated him when he came up to talk to me and found out I was your husband, not Sandy's. What do you mean, boo? She asked. I mean that he's either really jealous, doesn't like the fact that I'm your husband, or both. He covered it well, but his face was an open book for a few seconds. I gave her the veggies on how her boss was acting. Kelly nodded. So, what are we going to do about him? I shrugged. I have a few tricks up my sleeve to keep tabs on him, but until we know what he's planning, if anything, we can't really do anything. But, I have his cell signal cloned and I can spy on anything he says or does on that android of his. Kelly looked at with her, you crazy, boy look. I just smiled. Trust me, baby. I won't do anything if he doesn't. I'm not going to pick a fight with him. You know I trust you, boo. She reached across the table and squeezed my hand. I know, and I trust you too, sweetheart. What I need to know now is how much you've told him about me. I gave her a serious expression. She thought for a moment. Well, he knows we were both in the army, but not what we did while we were in. He knows that we went to college on the GI Bill, and he knows that you build computers. I smiled. Good. If he tries to get any more information out of you, just tell him that's all there is to tell. I can do that. She winked and squeezed my hand again. We finished our guacamole bacon burgers, fries, and shakes, and left. We then called our bosses and asked for the rest of the week off. When we got home, we fell into bed together, the urge overtaking us again as I kissed her passionately. In case you haven't noticed, I love screwing and making love to my wife. Well, we both managed to finagle the rest of the week off due to Thanksgiving and spent the holidays with my family. In spite of my brother, we had a great time and had some great food. Yeah, my mom can cook. Turkey, stuffing, cranberry sauce, corn of course, and some damn good smoked ham. On Black Friday, we decided to skip the sales rush and I started my intel gathering up on Mr. Richard Donald Jefferson. Dickhead. I found out some very useful information on him. Bing is a wonderful thing. Much more precise than Google for hard target searches. Mr. Jefferson had a record of assault and battery back east in Newark, New Jersey. It was 20 years old, but still on the books. He'd served his time and had been clean ever since, that anyone knew of. The particulars of the case set the klaxon going off in my head again, though. He'd beaten the crap out of a young man that had come home and caught his wife in bed with Dick. This was before Dick had gotten married. I remembered him at the real estate office, and he hadn't been wearing a wedding ring. More alarms went off in my head. I checked, and he was still married to Ariel Jefferson, nay Gardner. His wife was gorgeous. She reminded me quite a bit of Garcelle Beauvais, in fact. I then played a hunch on something and brought up the dickhead folder on my phone. I scrolled through his contact list and discovered something that sent a cold chill up my spine. The name, Cuck Jimmy, was attached to my boss's number. What the hell is Cuck Jimmy? I thought to myself, Cuck is in Cuck? Seriously? That had to be a sick joke. I kept scrolling and found a couple more numbers I recognized. The word cuck was attached to a diminutive nickname for them. Huh. I decided to dig a bit deeper and discovered our home phone number. Hot Kelly was on there next to our number. Well, she is hot. Smoking hot, in fact. But the fact that he had her name on there with hot attached to it was not a good sign. The beginnings of a plan started to form in my mind as I discovered more and more secrets about Dickwatt. By the time Kelly went out to get lunch for us, I'd already pieced together more than enough to form a plan of action. Something bad was coming down the pipe, and we needed to be ready. As soon as Kelly got back with the BK, we sat down and hashed out what we were going to do. She was shocked to see everything I'd been able to dig up on him. I ran a trace on all the numbers he had on his phone. Lawyer on speed dial. My boss. Our home phone. Also a few very unsavory thug types with records. Yes, I was gathering intel on not just him, but his minions or whatever, too. Yes, I knew what had to be done. I knew when it would be done and where it would be done. December came just after Thanksgiving, and we had finished all our shopping by the second weekend. The party would be on the 20th, so I had time to get all my pieces on the board set up the way I needed them to be. The night of the party, everyone from Kelly's office showed up, including Dick, of course. The party was a smash hit since we'd hired a caterer to deliver everything in advance for 20 people. Now, one of the numbers listed on Dick's phone had been Rob and Sue Charleston, our next-door neighbors, 
and the name Cuck Bobby in front of the number. We kept a close eye on them too. Also, I had wired my house for sight and sound. Every room fed into my BlackBerry on different screens, and the data was being stored on a cloud server. It would be ready to do what I needed it to do. I switched the spyware on Dick's phone to forward all texts to me for my approval, and to monitor and record his phone calls to the cloud server as well. And last but not least, I threw in a failsafe, just in case. Like I said, the party was a smash hit. The beer and eggnog was flowing freely, but at least we had a few designated drivers to get people and vehicles home. We also had a guest room for those who needed to spend the night and didn't have a ride otherwise. Strangely enough, but fortunately enough, nobody had too much to drink, and by 23.30 hours, everyone had left except for Dick. Somehow I knew after everyone else had gone, he would still be hanging around. I had been right. Well, Richard, I think it's time we went to bed. I smiled as I made a gesture for him to leave. I think you're right, Marky, he smirked. Yes, he actually had the nerve to call me Marky. What a shithead. Yes, we do need to go to bed, boss. That means you need to go home, Kelly chuckled. Nah, I think we need to have a little chat first. Come on over here and have a seat, he said. He went into our living room and sat down in my recliner while gesturing to the love seat for us to sit. Kelly's eyes widened as she saw him sit in my chair. Oh, he was going to pay for that. Nobody sits in my recliner but me. But I kept my cool as I sat down beside Kelly, and we interlaced our fingers as we looked at him expectantly. It's your dime, I said with a shrug. Just make it quick. Kelly and I have to go to bed. Since we have to wrap presents in the morning, he sat back and crossed his legs. We need to talk about your marriage and what's going to happen here tonight. Well. You're going to leave and we're going to bed, I shrugged back. Simple. I'm afraid not, Marky, he said with a smirk. There was Marky again. Oh, I was going to enjoy what happened next. Oh, then what's going to happen, Richard? I asked with a smile. Well, you have a fine wife there, Marky. He paid Kelly the compliment while pissing me off at the same time. His tone was one of authority. Yes, she is and she's all mine. I smiled and squeezed Kelly's hand as she smiled at me. I winked back at her. Thank you, Mr. Jefferson. Mark already knows I'm fine, though, she giggled. You're welcome, honey, Dick said, grinning ear to ear. He then turned back to me. Marky, you need to give up. You can't match my size, and I know you can't satisfy this fine sister. Kelly laughed. Mr. Jefferson, that's very inappropriate, and let me tell you, Mark satisfies me just fine. She had a smile on her face. I don't appreciate you coming in here and talking about him like you know him. But I do know him, baby. He's a boy who can't satisfy you. You know that, he exclaimed with an incredulous look on his face. I know that Mark satisfy me than any other man alive, Kelly smirked at him. Yeah, this wasn't going at all like Dickweed thought it would. Or maybe he thought it was going the way he thought it would. However, the end result would be the same. Oh yeah? he asked, standing abruptly and dropping Tro right there. The answer is still gonna be no, she said and squeezed my hand as she shook her head at him in the you ain't getting none gesture. Now it really wasn't going according to his plan, but was still well within the parameters of my plan. Come on, you arrogant. Give me my cue. I focused on his face again as frustration ran across it, followed by the arrogant expression again. Well, it would be in both of your best interests to do what I say when I say it. Or you'll both be out of a job, he snarled. Now he was losing his cool. Bad move on his part. Oh, and how will you take him why job, Dick? I asked with a smirk of my own. Because your boss is one of my cucks, moron. He damn near shouted at me. Oh, is he? And? I shrugged as I said it. And one word from me, and you're out of job, nutless. I just sat back and put my arm around Kelly, looking at him as I pulled my Blackberry out of my shirt pocket and brought up the menu. Well, I don't think that Cuck Jimmy is going to be a problem for us, actually. I smiled as I selected the file I wanted in the dickhead folder. Oh, the look on Dick Sucker's face was priceless. Okay, you asked for it. I was hoping to avoid this since I wanted that sweet piece of bum beside you to myself. But you leave me no choice, he said. He took out his Android and brought up a text and hit send. It was already pre-programmed in there, but what he sent wasn't what he'd written. You see, I know him. I know my enemy. 
I also know myself, but most importantly, I know my wife. I know, wives aren't mentioned in that passage of Sun Tzu's great treatise on war, but they should be. Han, you really have no idea what you've gotten yourself into. Kelly was shaking her head sadly at Dick. Just then there was a ring of our doorbell. I'll get it, Kelly said as she jumped up and walked briskly to the door. Dickhead took that moment to grin as he looked at me. Those are my homies now, Wonderbread. That little sister is gonna be ours in just a minute, and you're gonna be able to watch us take what's ours. This is a reclamation, shithead. Oh boo, look who just showed up. Kelly re-entered the room, bringing a woman who looked a lot like Garcelle Beauvais with her. Hello, Mark. I am Christina. I'm the wife of the idiot with his tool hanging out there, she said as she came and extended her hand. I rose to meet her, and shook her hand politely. Good to meet you, Christina. I think there's been a terrible misunderstanding here. It seems your husband is under the impression that he's going to have sex with my wife tonight. Were you aware of that? I asked. I shot a glance at Dick the Dork, and he had finished putting his dork back in his pants. How, where, what? How? Dick the douchebag asked. Where the hell is my crew? Oh, they just tried breaking into Chief Swanson's house. The cops knew about them from an anonymous tip, so they were snatched up in a hurry. I smiled at him. I hope they don't squeal on you to save their own hides, though. That would be quite a shame. Oh my God. He whispered to himself more than anyone else. He knew his house of cards was falling down around him. God, my friend, has nothing to do with this. So saying, I turned to Christina. Mrs. Jefferson, what is going to happen to Dick here? Dickless looked up with such fear in his eyes. I wondered how the arrogant Sinuvowich could have been this damn stupid. Well, thanks to your heads up this past weekend, he's gonna be sleeping someplace other than our house tonight. I am also pretty sure that he ain't gonna be sleeping here either, she said as she gave Dixit a nasty sneer. She then reached into her coat and produced a manila envelope, which she then handed to Mr. Dixies. You're served, shithead, she said with finality. Now, it's time for you to leave. I smiled and gestured towards the door. Dick started walking and I moved out of his way a bit so he could pass me on the way out. I was expecting what happened next, but he wasn't expecting my reaction. He lunged for me. Intent on wrapping his hands around my throat, I sidestepped and used my left knee to break a few of his ribs as I snapped a punch into his nose, causing his eyes to water. I then kicked him extremely hard right in the family jewels as he backed up stunned, holding his fractured ribs. Bad move, dick eater, I said calmly. Yes. The adrenaline was flowing through me, and yes, I was riding the waves of it as the fight, part of fight or flight, took over in me. I launched a series of punches into his face and gut, with two to the solar plexus in rapid succession. He couldn't see, and he couldn't breathe very well. I then launched another couple snap kicks to his knees, knocking him down. Then I finally hit 911 on my phone to report a belligerent party guest who had just tried to assault my wife and me. I reported that I had subdued him, but he may need medical attention. The cops and an ambulance were dispatched immediately to our address. After they'd all left, I turned to Christina as Kelly and I both hugged her. I'm really sorry about this, Christina. I know he's your husband, but at this time of year, I was interrupted. Honey, listen you two gave me the perfect Christmas gift. No Richard she grinned, and we all laughed together. Merry Christmas you two. Merry Christmas. Han, Kelly said as she hugged our newest friend. Merry Christmas, Christina. I added as I joined in the hug. Dick ended up charged with indecent exposure, assault, and sexual assault, as well as conspiracy to commit sexual assault and conspiracy to commit felony assault. His confession was already on tape with video to back it up, and I sent those to the cops with my compliments. Dick's lawyer tried to cut a plea deal, but the DA wasn't having it, and in the end, he was sentenced to 20 years in Folsom. His crew were all ex-cons who had two felonies apiece for various offenses. Attempting to break into the chief of police's house earned them life in Folsom under the three-time loser law along with their good buddy Dick. Seems they thought Dick had set them up for some odd reason. Well, needless to say, Dick didn't fare too well in the joint. The COs found him swinging in his cell three months after he first arrived there. He had been badly beaten before he committed suicide, but nobody saw nothing. How did I do it? 
How did I set everything up? Well, for those who didn't realize it by now, I knew my enemy. You see, everything in Sun Tzu's masterpiece can be applied to any given situation when it comes to dealing with an adversary. Another favorite piece of wisdom in the art of war is fight the enemy where he isn't. I called up Christina and got her on my side when I explained the situation to her. He wasn't there, so I fought him there. Christina had always suspected him of cheating, but could never get any proof. He had control of their finances, and she couldn't get the money together to hire a PI without him finding out. But it all had come down to knowing my enemy. When all was said and done, Dick was an arrogant dick. He thought he knew it all. He thought that I would cave. Why on earth would he think that? Well, I had Kelly feed him misinformation about me. When he questioned her about my time in the army, Kelly said that I was a clerk with no combat experience. Having no reason to disbelieve her, he bought it. James, my boss? In case you were wondering, he wasn't too broken up about Dick getting thrown in the pin and dying there. In fact, as soon as that happened, he divorced his cheating 304 of a wife and got away relatively unscathed. He had not been a willing participant since Dick had threatened him and his children. Dick was a strong-arm type thug. He was well-educated and highly intelligent, but his arrogance made him stupid. He thought that his monster schlong was enough to get any woman into bed. Unfortunately, those women thought with their own and didn't really love their husbands. Kelly loves me and thinks with her heart. I love my wife. Dear listeners, please share your thoughts in the comment section below and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.